Hello my lovely friends, it's Yulia here from EMBT. Before we delve into the spinal video about Tiaguan EMT sourcing adventures, I have been dreaming of this trip for many many years and I was hoping that it would be really glamorous and really beautiful. But in reality it was quite challenging, so glamour wasn't really on our agenda it turns out. Nonetheless, it is what it is and I thought it would be useful to share it with you guys so that you guys know where your tea came from. And I also know that lots of you are interested in doing your own tea sourcing, so I think it will prove useful to those of you in the future. So here it goes! Our well, couple of weeks in Gandhi town were coming to an end. We really wanted to go up to the mountains to look for high mountain Gandhi Tiaguanian, but the issue was transport. There were no taxis here as such in this little town, let alone taxis with a powerful yet nimble enough vehicle to take us up to the mountains. But after a bit of searching, faint hearted that we came across this young man. He grew up at the top of these Gande mountains and you can almost say he has known every slope and every tea plant in these beautiful highlands since he was a boy. But unusually his family doesn't produce tea guanine, meaning that there was no conflict of interest for us because he had no tea guanine to sell to us. And most importantly he was willing to act as our most helpful taxi for the day, an accidental encounter which ended up blossoming into a beautiful friendship. But let's rewind a little here and start from the beginning. So we wake up with the town cockroaches at 4am and set off to go high up into the mountains. The first tea master we went to see was a little house in a village right at the top of the mountain. This was our first fateful encounter with Su Jin Dui. You didn't pick, you didn't pick tea yesterday, or? Mountain. Ah. <laughs> we did like the tea he first given us, but we asked if he had anything else. And indeed he had. His highest grade tea, of which he had very, very little, blew us away. But a little bit more on that in a second. Here is the lovely view from Su Jin Dui's house. Seriously, isn't this just absolutely beautiful, guys? where Su Jin Dui both lives and makes his tea. This is the room where Su Jin Dui makes his tea and holds tea tastings for anyone who has come to visit him. Here we also have the Tia Guan Yin roller, the baking oven and even a broom to maintain this area dust and tea leaf free. So Su Jin Du is highest grade Tia Guan Yin, the one we really love the most, was a traditional Long Seng style Tia Guan Yin. But unlike any other Tia Guan Yin we tried so far, this one was much more full of flavor, even though it was still the more subtle, more oxidized traditional style Tia Guan Yin. It was very sweet, nectary, buttery and fruity with an apricot sort of complexity, no astringency and held steepings incredibly well. Those of you who watch our Insta stories will remember me reporting this from the field. Right guys, so we're in the first tea master's house now. His, his tea is amazing compared to anything what we've tried yesterday and even a couple of days ago. We're high up in the mountains, this is the first village. So this is how the tea master is separating the bits from the actual tea. So the bits of the tea are falling down to the bottom and the tiguanin, the whole leaf tiguanin is left. Wow. So skillful. So here the tea master is uh, putting the tea leaves into piles to allow them to wilt under the sun for a little bit. The sun isn't very strong here, uh, but the tea leaves have been plugged this morning and it's the first time I'm seeing this, so it's really cool. Mm. As the tea master has explained, only three to four top leaves are picked for this tea, so it's not a bud tea, it's always a leaf tea with the tiguanin. It's the first time they're plucking the tea leaves because it's been raining for a really long time in this area, so we're super lucky to actually be able to witness this process. Naturally, the next thing we wanted to see was the place where Wu Laing, Su Jin Dui's wife, was growing the leaves. After a bit of a hike up the mountain, we were there. Wu Laing was swiftly and skillfully plucking the leaves with the help of a few other ladies. And sure enough, I decided to give it a go at the plucking. But it turned out to not be quite as straightforward as I'd hoped. Because you needed to know which leaves to pluck. Only certain three to four top leaves that with the right size and color were allowed to be plucked. 
While the ladies were plucking, we decided to examine the little tea garden. As you can see there's water collecting down here. The first thing we noticed is that the tea here is growing in slopes as opposed to on flat surfaces like you saw in Suwon Ji's garden in my earlier video. Mm -hmm. So we are now at the plantation of the tea master whose tea guanin we like the most. His wife is plucking the tea together with a couple of other ladies, so it's a very small uh, family community. We've come here to have a look at the environment where the tea is grown, because just because we like the flavour profile, the scent, the texture of the tea and how it holds the brews, doesn't mean necessarily that it's grown in the best conditions without pesticides, without uh, fertiliser and um, so the environment where the tea grows can say a lot about the quality of the tea. When I was studying tea in the UK, I've learned that the best tea grows on slopes and together with other vegetation. When we visited this particular tea plantation, we were really glad to know that this tea does indeed grow on slopes in conjunction with other weeds and even cabbage, even their own food basically, uh, which is lovely. Also, I tried picking the tea myself and I've seen insects on my on my arm um, after just a couple of minutes of being in the plantation so it suggests that the tea is grown without pesticides like we've been told and we've seen that the tea is indeed hand-picked which isn't surprising because machinery is incredibly difficult to get up here especially on the slopes because it's very very steep here. It really makes you appreciate how labor-intensive this process is. So the reason that slopes are so good for the best chiguanin and for the best tea is because it allows the water to drain through and uh, we've seen pools of water collected over there which means that the water is running through the tea rather than standing water. This is good because it brings with it lots more minerals and lots more nutrients for the tea plant. Also as an environmental scientist I know that uh, biodiversity is incredibly important for a plantation not only because it's so good for the environment but also because it means that the plants compete with each other meaning that all of the plants are much more likely to be sturdy and they also grow in balance which is very good great news from the environmental standpoint and also from the standpoint of us as, a, as the consumer who wants to, ha to get the best quality tea and the best flavour. This is because from the evolutionary perspective it means that only the best tea will survive and outcompete the weeds that are very well suited for this area. Also, having other plant varietals here can help improve water retention and nitrogen fixation in the soil, resulting in a stronger, healthier and more nutrient-dense tea plants and thus improving the flavour of the tea. Also the fact that this tea grows so high up in the mountains is very good news because it means that there's less likely to be a lot less pollution than down in the lowlands, especially residential and industrial pollution. Other things we noticed is that the tea plants are planted in thin rows of one or two and the soil composition here was more porous than like Suwonji's tea garden, for example, making micronutrients more bioavailable. Also notice that the tea trees are relatively young. Tia Guanyin is unique compared to other tea varietals because whilst for most other teas, the older the tea tree, the better, but for Tia Guanyin, it is believed that three-year-old trees provide the best flavor. This is because this is when the tea leaves are believed to have the most of those light aromatic compounds that produce the characteristic nectary flavor, which is quite unique to Tia Guanyin. All of this, together with the high elevation and the slightly cooler, more humid environment here, is believed to be beneficial for the formation of polysaccharides, amino acids and aromatic compounds in the leaves and fewer bitter catechins which results in a more vibrant flavour and helps the tea hold deepings better. After taking a thorough look at the tea garden, we decided to hurry back so we can visit as many tea masters as possible. Tia Guanyin lacks a relatively high rainfall. This is why little rain shelters were constructed here, so the tea pickers can hide from the rain. But if the tea leaves get wet, so Jin Dui asks that the entire collection is brutally discarded because it ruins the flavor of the tea. That's why we saw lots of tea leaves scattered all over his garden such as what you can see here. At the end of the day, we found out that the reason for why our driver took us to Sujindui was because Sujindui was known amongst the locals for making good tea. But we are glad our driver hasn't told us that earlier, as we wouldn't have believed him anyway. We wanted to ensure that Sujindui's tea was indeed as good as we thought it was and to compare it to other tea masters in this area. So on we went. <laughs> Just that in 67 villages now wait to drink tea. Every village on this mountain makes tea guanyin. Everyone was so warm and inviting. I think it helped greatly that our driver was a local, so we felt very welcome. 
As you can see, BBT Master is perhaps the most unconventional job one can have. Not only do you work from home, but you also end up involving your entire family in tea making and selling. You have to accept strangers at any time of day or night into your house or want to drink your tea with you. Or maybe we're just incredibly lucky that no one had turned us down. Either way, because of this, we were incredibly lucky to witness the day-to-day -day lives of the tea families. This tea master in particular had a really lovely tea guanyin and we really liked his baked cow tea guanyin, but we definitely preferred Su Jindu's. Taitian! Taitian! To cut the long story short, it was a very long and tiring yet exhilarating day drinking gallons of tea guanyin and different tea masters. On our quest to find a tea guanyin that at least matched so Jinjuis, we ended up in another township many kilometers away, actually on another mountain, in a small village in Changqing township, which is also known to have one of the best terrors for tea guanyin just like Gande. When we arrived at Master Wang's house, no one seemed to notice us because the whole family were too busy tending to their Tiaguanyin leaves, hiding them from the cloud that hung over the village whilst the leaves were withering. We didn't get to film much of the drinking process, but after trying Master Wang's Qingxiang Tiaguanyin, we had a very good feeling that we'd found another Tiaguanyin, finally, which matched the Jindui's. But this one was a completely different style. It was the modern Tia Guanyin, while Su Jindui's was a traditional Longxiang style. To understand the differences between Longxiang and Qingxiang, check out my video on the top right hand corner of the screen. Sadly, we didn't get to film as much of Master Wang's tea garden for too long because it was raining hard most of the time by the time we got there. But here it is briefly Mrs. Wang is doing the singing. As you can see, it also shares many of the characteristics of Su Jindu's tea garden and also comes from high elevation. Here they call mountain tea Shan Qing, which means mountain green. Basically, we had realized that we will not be able to find the long thing that much Su Jindu's, so we hurried back all the way to the top of the other mountain, about an hour's motorbike drive away, in the pouring rain, to grab some of Su Jindu's wonderful long thing tea going in before somebody else does. We asked Su Jindui to kindly say something about himself and his tea to give you guys the chance to get to know him. Jalakiu Ah, ah. He can only speak the Minan dialect rather than Mandarin. We've done our best to translate, but it may be inaccurate. After having had home cooked and home grown dinner with Sujin Dui, his wife, and his son, we went to see the process of the shaking of the leaves. This might sound like the simplest step of the Tiaguanyin making process, but it's really not, and I think I never mastered it. No matter how hard I tried, I ended up dropping more precious leaves than shaking them. They had some friends round as well who were excited to also help Su Jindui with the shaking and also to take photos of us, since foreigners are such a rare sight here. The atmosphere overall was a lot of fun and we didn't want to leave. We were super lucky because we got the very last batch of Su Jindui's best tea. The rest was quickly bought up by a wholesaler from Xiamen who came by in the evening. Other than the occasional wholesaler, Su Jindu doesn't see quite as many tea buyers in this isolated mountainous village compared to the tea masters down at the bottom of the mountain in Gande town, because Su Jindu only makes Mao Cha. Mao Cha means he doesn't sort the tea to separate the twigs from the leaves. He also doesn't export his tea down from the mountain, he only makes it. What's more, Su Jindu doesn't have any means of communication, not even a mobile phone. 
And usually no one in his family does actually, not even his son, which makes it much harder to export his tea logistics-wise. Because the Jindui makes only Mao Tsa and doesn't export it, it makes buying from him difficult, and so few people, other than wholesalers, buy from him directly. Most people buy the Jindui's tea from resellers in Gande and all over China, like Xiamen, after it has been sorted. But of course, buying from resellers also increases the price of the tea and doesn't give the tea buyers the assurance of where the tea was grown and made. That's why we decided to buy from Su Jindui directly and then we sorted the tea later. I've tried lots and lots of teas today. We are now back to the village, small village near Chengqing. A very long, tiring day. After having tried countless Qingxiang tea guanyins, we'd also realized that we couldn't return home without Master Wang's Qingxiang tea guanyin. So believe it or not, we drove all the way back to the Huamei village near Chengqing, which was an hour's drive away from Su Jindui, in the dark and pouring rain to grab the tiny batch of Master Wang's Qingxiang tea guanyin as well. It was 10 p.m. here by the time we got there and the family was still really busy with their tea, shaking the leaves to let them wither overnight. But I did manage to grab a hold of Master Wang and his wife to take a photograph with them for a second. Next week you will see us go to Guangdong province to source the famous Dansong Oolongs, so stay tuned!